Okay, so this is part two of chapter one, introduction to the uh, TAC 21. Actually, I think what I'm gonna do here is just kind of back up. If you recall last week, we kind of talked about the rationale for um, higher education for counselors. We're gonna continue that conversation tonight. Um, these were the topics that we covered uh, at the, during the last lecture. Um, this is the introduction to TAP 21, which was the, um, uh, the publication that really defined the 123 competencies that we will be working through in this semester. So, all right. So how did this come about? So initially, um, you know, there was the Birch Davis study in 1986, which we talked about during the, the last uh, lecture. And the Birch Davis study, what they did was they were trying to um, determine best they could at that point, what competencies were really needed for, um, uh, for addiction counseling. The other thing that came out of that research though, it's not really clear how it came about was the 315 hour um, national standard for training addiction counselors. So I will just tell you, if you think about what you have to do in AODS program here, Alcohol and Drug Studies program at San Diego City College, in order to achieve just the certificate of achievement, right? That is 36 uh, units. Um, that, which is a lot, 315 hours roughly translates to about 20 units. So you can already see that you're actually doing a little bit more than what the national standard um, is. But the, also the argument has been over the years that uh, really the 315 and maybe even the 36 units may not be um, enough. So in 1993, in the early 90s, uh, SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Organiz uh, 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 Administration, keep saying the wrong word, sorry, um, created the Addiction Technology Transfer Centers. Um, and there are 11 of them. They're regional across the United States and I believe uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Um, and they set these centers up. Uh, and the ATTCs then created the National Curriculum Committee. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to conduct research into existing practice and existing professional literature. So a few minutes ago, when I showed you how to access research articles through our library, this is what we're talking about, professional literature. In other words, it's it's research that's being conducted or been conducted and published around, uh, in this particular case, specifically on um, techniques, uh, therapeutic interventions, and, and, and those kinds of things for addiction treatment. So that's what the National Curriculum Committee uh, was doing. As a result of all of that, they also developed an extensive list of addiction practice competencies, um, which is actually the forerunner to the TAP 21. So they had quite a comprehensive list. And after they created this list, then they um, actually did a national survey. They did some more research to determine, does this list, is this list accurate, right? Is this what people are actually doing? Um, and does it, uh, is it valid, right? Is this list of competencies valid? So that was uh, the research that they were conducting. Put all of that together. And then in 1998, the TAP 21 was officially published. Um, it was revised in, um, I believe 2000 and, um, they did some revamping of it in 2005. And I believe I also informed you guys in the last lecture, and I'll repeat it here, that in 2015, they actually updated it again. So, um, so they're constantly looking at, at, at the research for this. One of the things that I want you guys to realize is the 
the competencies are based in scientific research. So this isn't just stuff that people pulled out of the air. This isn't anecdotal evidence. This is actual um, researched um, uh, competencies. As a result of that, they also um, wanted to describe the uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, right? Those are KSAs. Uh, and I briefly talked about them in the last lecture, introduced them. And we're going to talk about it in a little bit more detail. And so underneath the competencies, if you were to ever look through the, the TAP 21, um, you know, it has, it has the competencies and then underneath the competencies, it tells you what skills a person needs, uh, what knowledge they need, um, and, and, and what's the attitude they need to be demonstrating in order um, uh, to, to be able to, to match that competency. The other thing that they came up with was the transdisciplinary foundations. And what they describe these as is these are the building blocks for um, what we're going to talk about next, which is the um, eight practice dimensions. But these are the, the building blocks of addiction treatment. So in other words, if you're going into addiction treatment, everyone, regardless of, of where you work, what your position is, um, if it's clinical, it's all of this still counts. Um, the population you work with, it, none of that matters um, as far as this goes. What they're saying here is understanding addiction, in other words, how it, how it works, how it affects the brain, right? Um, the disease model of addiction, you know, um, understanding how neurotransmission works, uh, understanding how, um, what's the difference between an agonist and an antagonist, Right, uh, knowing that addiction is um, uh, progressive uh, and um, and a relapsing disease, right? Uh, it all of that is important. It's under. It's really important that people understand that. If you're a professional in the addiction treatment field, you have to understand addiction. The other thing is treatment knowledge. Professionals in the field should understand the various types of treatment interventions um, and also be able to apply those in their practice, right? So CBT has been very heavily researched for, um, for lots of different uh, things in the DSM-5, but um, specifically on how it works with addiction, right? Um, looking at Gorski's model of relapse prevention is another example. Um, motivational interviewing, right? Um, is a is, is a way that we engage clients. Um, and that's all part of part of that treatment knowledge and it's part of being able to apply that to your practice. And then of course there's professional readiness, right? So that also would include schooling, you know, understanding law and ethics, um, all of the different things that 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 we do here. Um, so those are the, the basic building blocks. Without these, if, 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 a, if an individual does not have these, then their ability to engage in treatment or apply the competencies is gonna be limited, right? Until they, uh, until they get that. So it's also important to recognize the word transdisciplinary, right? In, in the four transdisciplinary foundations. And what that means is medicine, social work, um, you'll see pastoral guidance here. There's lots of research that shows that spirituality can really enhance a person's recovery um, and really benefit that. Um, so, you know, professionals not really shying away from that. Um, corrections, people being justice involved, social welfare. Some other things I'll say too is, um, you know, over the years and especially recently, if you've been working in the field, you may notice that there's a lot of merging between mental health and addiction treatment. So there's a lot more, um, a lot more of that happening. Um, there may be some people here that work in, a, I'll give you an example, 
So one of our programs, um, uh, Action East, which is a neighbor of my program where I work. So they have a doctor on staff, they have a nurse, um, they actually um, have SUD counselors, they have mental health clinicians, and that would be an example of transdisciplinary, right? That they have all those different, different options there. Where I work, obviously I'm an LPHA, so I'm a mental health clinician, um, but we're mainly substance, of, substance uh, use disorder treatment. Um, we're co-occurring, we can handle co-occurring, but we're not considered necessarily a behavioral health um, or a mental health program or a substance use program. But transdisciplinary there would include me being a mental health clinician versus the um, uh, versus the substance use counselors. Although I am actually both because I started uh, working as a as an addiction counselor first and just continued on. So whenever you see transdisciplinary, that's what we're talking about. Um, different people having different roles that go across a spectrum. And it's all designed to help clients um, get these wraparound services that they need as well. All right, so let's talk about the eight practice dimensions. Um, now the book goes into a little bit more detail. I'm gonna highlight some of these um, now, but we're also gonna highlight it, um, some items of it when, we, uh, when I talk about the chapter 14 documentation as well. But the eight practice dimensions came out of the TAP 21. If you've been around for a while, you may be familiar with the, um, the 12 core uh, functions of addiction counseling. And the 12 core functions um, did not come from uh, the TAP 21. This is what came from the TAP 21. And in a few minutes, we'll compare the two. Um, but in this semester, what we'll be teaching are the eight practice dimensions. So. And the first thing is clinical evaluation, and that's mainly screening and assessment. Um, so screening is um, where you determine whether or not this individual is appropriate for your program. And if not, what program might they be um, appropriate for? Because ethically, we should be making referrals if we're not gonna do an intake on that. So I'll just kind of say that. But screening is part of clinical evaluation. And then assessment, that comes in many different forms. Um, very formalized in the form of like the addiction severity index, which is the ASI. Um, and I know I'm throwing some things out that some of you students might not know what it is, but it's, it's kind of like a biopsychosocial so, bio assessment that looks at every area of a person's life. Um, and then also uh, looks at their substance use and tries to, you know, uh, build the information so that a diagnosis of a substance use disorder can be rendered. Uh, but it looks at mental health, it looks at your recovery environment, it looks at lots of different things. So that's part of assessment. And then based on your assessments, you know, you would move into your treatment planning phase, right? So what are the goals of the client? Um, uh, what do they want to work on? What do they need to work on? Things like that. Treatment planning may also lead into referral and service coordination. And so here's what I will say about referral. And again, we'll do a whole section of this later on in the semester. But a referral is not just handing a person a piece of paper that says, oh, here, you can go get your physical at this place. Give them a call. That is not a referral. All you've done is provide them with a resource, right, which is great. Um, but that's not a referral. A referral is where you actually work with the client, help them set up the appointment, and then you're probably even following up with the appointment, you know, with the with the referral at the other end, saying, "Hey, you know, did this person um, did they make it? Is there anything we need to do?" And that's where also service coordination comes in. Now we'll also add in coordination of care uh, for an individual. Uh, and then, of course, there's counseling. We'll do a section on counseling later on in the semester, and that's individual counseling, that's family counseling, that's uh, uh, um, uh, group counseling, uh, psychoeducation can, can kind of throw in, in there a little bit, um, under six, actually, with client, 
client education, family education, uh, and then educating the community um, about addiction and maybe even the services that you provide. And then seven, um, documentation. That's where burp notes are gonna come in later. That's part of documentation. Um, but whenever we're conducting services, we have to document what we have done with our clients. Um, and then finally, our professional and ethical responsibilities. And, and again, we'll be doing a whole section later on in the semester on, on professional uh, readiness will be part of that. And then something to, that's important is that each of these practice dimensions has their own set of competencies. And then of course, uh, I said this earlier on the previous slide, right? Um, each competency has their own um, KSAs, right? Which is the knowledge, skills, and attitudes uh, necessary for effective addiction counseling. And that, you know, and the word effective here is, is really important. That's, that's what we're trying to be, um, which is why these competencies, why education, uh, and then once you're certified, continuing education is important to stay up with the, the latest research and the latest information. All right, so here are the four transdisciplinary foundations and the eight practice dimensions all kind of put together in a, um, in a graphic, right? And so you'll notice at the center of, of the graphic, the center of the circle, uh, actually kind of looks like spokes going to, to other circles. Um, that is your basic information that we talked about. Uh, those are the, the basic building blocks, understanding addiction, treatment knowledge, application to practice, and, and a person's professional readiness. Those are key, they're mandatory, because if you don't have that, then the other things in, on the outside, the eight practice dimensions, um, you're not going to be able to, or a person is not going to be able to do those effectively. So it's important that we, we know and understand all of these. Um, and that's the purpose of, the, of, of this entire uh, semester is to get you into these things. So that's why we're doing the treatment planning, you know, at the end of the semester. That's why you're doing the paper on the TTM. Um, it's why you're going to do a diagnosis um, paper uh, and so that you're kind of getting all of this material and just realize that even as much work as you're doing this semester, um, you know, there's always going to be more to learn. And I always want to encourage people never stop learning, always keep going. All right. So as promised earlier, I told you that, that we would be looking at um, the 12 core functions uh, in comparison to the eight practice dimensions. And you'll notice that in the 12 core functions, there's a lot of similarities. Um, uh, you'll see there's the same things, it's just reordered um, and repackaged a little bit. For instance, under the eight practice dimensions, item number one, clinical evaluation, you have screening and assessment. That's what all comes under that. Under the 12 core functions, you have screening and assessment listed out separately. I would also argue that even at intake, there's probably a little bit of assessment happening, right? Um, depending on what forms you're filling out and what's happening there, right? During the intake process. So you could see that, that, that there is similarities um, and um, so hopefully it won't be too confusing. A couple of things to point out though, there is item number four under the eight practice dimensions is service coordination. Um, and, and that's where that's the administrative, clinical and evaluative activities that bring the client to treatment services, right? So these are the issues that get focused on. These are the things that we need to, to identify for treatment planning um, and helping the client meet those. And item number seven, over under the 12 core functions is case management, which is also part of what we're talking about in this class. And these are the activities that a professional would do that's designed to bring you know, agencies together and resources together with the individual so that they can meet their goals, right? 
Um, if a person comes in, I'll give you an example. Um, if a person comes in and, uh, and they want to engage in, well, healthcare, because they've been using for the past couple of years and haven't gone to uh, a doctor in forever, um, or they're having problems with their teeth, or they've been using um, uh, opiates and want to get on a uh, medically medicated assisted treatment like Sublocade, Vivitrol, um, uh, Suboxone, Methadone, whatever. Um, this is where case management comes together to actually connect the clients with those services and agencies if you are not able to provide those. Because sometimes we'll, you know, like my, where I work, um, we, we can't provide MAT. Um, so we have to refer that out and we coordinate with um, another agency to do that. So that's part of that case management. Um, and it also involves, you know, being a liaison um, between those activities and collateral contacts. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's what case management is, kind of similar to service coordination, but there are some, some differences there. All right, so um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. So I'm just gonna stop here for a minute because we went through a couple of slides. And if you have a question, you can type it into the chat. Or if you don't mind your voice being on YouTube, you may unmute yourself and ask a question. I have a question. Yeah. Um, will case management um, positions uh, fit into the eight practice is the eight practice dimensions for um internship and or uh, be becoming um uh, not registered but certified yes um i my initial answer to that question would be yes at least that's been in my experience okay. however it depends on the agency you're working for and what your duties are are right so you want to you want to check with that first, right? Um, yeah. But in general, uh, my experience is, is that um, a lot of people, uh, and we're going to talk about the, the, the latter here in a few minutes. So okay. some of this will be answered a little bit. But, um, but, but yes, check with the agency and make sure. The other thing about certification that's important is that there is a... Um, that there is a certified clinical supervisor that can sign off on your materials, right? So if there is, that's not an issue. Um, but most places, again, most places where you guys are gonna go, that's not gonna be an issue, right? So. What is a certified clinical supervisor really quickly? Sorry. <laughs> that is an addiction specialist or addiction, certified addiction um, counselor, either a, a LADAC or a, or a CADC3, CATC4, but, okay. but with a special CCS certification. So in other words, they've received training in how to supervise addiction counselors. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, and then just a reminder, remember if you unmute, uh, place yourself back on mute. All right. All right, so let's, take a little shot of this video. I'm actually gonna, because I think there's a copyright issue with this. So what I'm gonna do is to not violate copyright. We're allowed to show it in class. I just may not be allowed to rebroadcast it on YouTube. Um, so I'm gonna stop the recording. We're gonna watch the video, have a discussion, and then I will restart the uh, video and continue with the rest of the lecture. So let me pause the recording. Okay, so we just completed the, um, so you wanna be a case manager video uh, and, have, and we're having a discussion which led into the um, education and the career ladder. So this is where we are at the moment in the lecture. Um, one question that has come in is, is there a big difference between SUD counselor, RADT1 and an intake specialist coordinator? Well, 
that, so to answer that question, first of all, intake specialist coordinator is a job title and not a certification. So um, an intake specialist coordinator, I would think could be an RADT1, um, but it may not be. So it depends on the agency, but we are kind of like talking a little bit of apples and oranges there. Does that make sense? If you want to type in to the chat uh, a clarification, or if I answered your question, let me know. Um, but that's how I see, see those two items that you bring up. So in this ladder, let's just talk about the ladder for a minute and where RADT would fall in, because that's going to be coming up in a slide in a minute. But SAMHSA came up with this career ladder. and. Um, uh, and they, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, chat came up and threw me off. Uh, let me finish my statement and I'll answer that question. Uh, so they came up with this um, career ladder for substance use um, disorder counselors. And you'll notice they have an entry level, there's a category one um, that's list listed as like an associate substance use counselor, um, which, uh, would be, looks as, hold on one second. Um, this is an individual with an associate's degree, um, including a hundred hours of addiction coursework. Um, and then even with that, according to SAMHSA, they still need to work under um, supervision. So the question that came in um, that I'll answer now was, should an SUD counselor be doing intake? Um, again, that would be, in my mind, that's an agency decision. Um, I will say, I will tell you where, where I work, we have SUD counselors that do handle intakes. Um, we have case managers that handle intakes. So the way we get intakes, um, depending on what day of the week it is, it could be a different person that's actually doing it. So we don't have a specific intake coordinator per se. Um, another agency may have an intake coordinator and their requirement might be that they are an SUD counselor, fully certified, or they might um, say no for intake coordinator, that person only needs to be registered because intake, where there are some clinical aspects to it, it's not exactly like you're doing you know, counseling. And uh, one other thing I wanna say about um, counseling and what we do as addiction counselors. Counseling is different than therapy. It often looks the same and there are a lot of similarities to it, but an addiction counselor is not providing therapy that is outside their scope of practice. In order to provide therapy and therapeutic interventions um, based on mental health and and other things, uh, that person has to have a master's degree um, or above in order to uh, say that they're providing therapy. Otherwise, what is being provided is counseling. So there is a difference. All right, so I see some questions coming up in chat. So let me look at these. Um, Oh, uh, let's see. All right. Yes, I was hired as an SUD counselor, asked to take the intake specialist position on top of the SUD. Yeah, exactly. So that's an example of what I would say um, is that agency decision. And so as an RADT, your job title is intake specialist um, or for the one person. And then the other individual that is also doing intake is also an SUD counselor. So yes, the thing with um, SUD counselor is one thing that's, that's really important is that you need to make sure that you're registered, right? Because you cannot provide, not ethically, um, clinical services if you're not, not registered. Um, in the state of California, for instance, uh, um, Drug Medi-Cal, you know, will not pay for um, uh, 
will not pay for services that are not being provided by a certified um, counselor or a registered um, counselor individual, right? So that's really important to know. And the reason why is because if a person that's registered is um, if they're uh, if you're registered and currently going to school, at least you're getting, you're, you're going through that process. Um, but it shows that, that you're either obtaining or have obtained the requisite education in order to provide the service, okay? Um, and again, you work under uh, clinical supervision. The other question that came in, what is a substance use technician? Um, that is SAMHSA's title for that level. And I would say that's probably, because I can't remember if I have this on a, because I know we're doing some comparisons on another slide. So I'm gonna answer the question now, but my answer <laughs> with this caveat may change. I may have to correct myself, but I would be looking at this as like, kind of like a peer support specialist um, might fall into this category of substance use disorder technician. So in other words, it's the lowest ladder, least least amount of, um, of training and education, uh, but it's a great place to start to get your, get your foot in the door of an agency and start learning and seeing how the environment goes. All right, so these categories go on and you'll see that um, as the categories go on, so does the education. Um, so a clinical substance use counselor is, uh, is a person with a master's degree, um, including 300 hours of addiction work. So uh, you'll see in the comparison, so that, that's the level that I'm at according to SAMHSA, I am category three, uh, but here in the state of California uh, under Katy, um, which is the certifying body, one of the certifying bodies that I'm with, I'm a CATC four, which is a um, master's level addiction, certified addiction treatment counselor. Um, so it kind of matches up with that. And we'll see those comparisons uh, in a minute. And then you'll see category four, it says independent clinical substance use counselor or supervisor. And so this is a person that is, has a master's degree or other postgraduate degree, and they are also licensed to practice independently. Now here in the state of California, we do not have licensure for addiction counselors. I think we should, they keep putting it up there, um, but it hasn't happened here in, in the state of California. When it does, that would be equivalent to category four, according to SAMHSA. All right, so let's look at some comparisons here. So here in California, um, and by the way, this school is a KD um, accredited school, and that's why um, you'll see a lot of what we do here is based on KD and not CCAP, although I will talk about CCAP as well. So you'll see that um, uh, their basic is uh, the CATC, and that is a person with a high school diploma or 315 hours or 20 units of addiction specific education or counseling. And like I pointed out before, you guys actually get 36 units here. And what I would encourage people to do um, which is why, uh, by the way, which is why uh, CATC1 is what most people will be able to qualify for because we actually do the full 36 unit certificate here, right? So in other words, nobody really leaves here with a CATC basic or, or being able to qualify for that. Uh, if you do everything here, you know, you can um, become certified as a CATC1, which is the certificate from City College. I highly recommend people you're here. I would look into, you know, looking to get the, the AS degree here as well. Um, the better educated you are, again, as was pointed out earlier, actually rate of pay goes up, right? So CATC2 um, is someone that has an AS degree. A CATC3 is someone with a bachelor's degree. And then of course, uh, I already talked about me a little bit. I have a CATC4 and that's a master's degree. Plus the, I was already certified 
um, earlier. So um, as a certified addiction counselor. So when I got my master's, I just had to submit all of that um, in order to uh, become a CATC4. And then a CATC5 um, is a doctorate level. So that's someone with a PhD, uh, an MD, a medical degree, or actually a medical doctor, or a PsyD, which is a doctorate in psychology, plus the um, other ones. The other cool thing is the CATCN, which is the registered nurse that also meets the CATC education requirement. And I believe, oh, I might be confusing this class with my psychology class, because I have um, AODS students in my psychology class as well. And um, someone's going for a nursing degree and they wanted to pursue uh, the CATC education requirements. And that, that too is really, really awesome. Um, uh, registered nurses in addiction programs, uh, there's probably gonna be more of them coming up in years. Um, they're already in them now. And that's just, uh, I love hearing that, but that's something that's needed. So you can get that certification. All right, there's a couple questions from chat. One question is, is uh, how much more school do we need for an AA or an AS degree? Um, I do not remember the number of units that you would need. Um, this is where an education plan would come in that we talked about. Um, Oh, I'm not sure, but it's basically a two year degree. So think about 36 units. You could do that in a year um, if that's all you focused on. Um, so we're talking another year of school, at least. Now, how many units that represents? Off the top of my head, I cannot say for certain and don't want to give you misinformation. What is it? Six. Okay, so 60 units. Okay. Yeah, so it's 60 units, so um, so 24 more units above the C, uh, the AODS program. So I highly recommend people doing that. Um, the other thing is, the other question was, can you be certified with multiple certifying bodies? Yes, you can, I am. Um, I am certified with both KD and with CCAP. Um, though it is not required um, and it costs more money and may not be advantageous. It was just the way things worked out for me. And I'll be honest, every year when I renew, I think, should I just drop one? And I just haven't dropped one yet. So um, my recommendation is for people to get registered with Katie um, as soon as they can and begin earning their hours toward the CATC. Once you get that, then you can, um, uh, if you wanna go to CCAP, you can. Um, you know. And then another question, what is the benefit with being certified with multiple certifying bodies? There is none other than being able to say, I am double board certified. Again, I don't recommend it. It's just something that happened with me I initially um, got certified with uh, C with Katie, um, and was with Katie for a while, and then uh, it was strongly recommended because that's what people were looking for back then. Oh, they're looking for KDAC, KDAC, KDAC. So I registered with KDAC with the intention of dropping um, Katie, um, uh, but I never did, and um, so. And I'll be honest, the one that I keep considering dropping is not my KD CATC4. It's actually my, my CCAP CADC3. Um, so I hope that answers your question. There really isn't a benefit, not anymore. Cherish, I see your hand. Yeah, so I've heard this a couple times too, but I ended up starting off with CCAP. And mm -hmm. in your experience, why would you rather have the uh, K Katie KDAC? So the difference between, and it's a great question, um, the difference between uh, Katie and KDAC initially was this. Katie was more focused on the education 
component of it. They've been advocating, and you'll read in chapter one, if you haven't read it yet, for those that may not have gotten your book yet, but you'll read in chapter one that Katie has really spearheaded in California the importance of advancing education. Because education is, is and I am, I am a big advocate for education. Um, mm -hmm. Earlier on in the, in the first lecture, I said, you know, our clients come to us, um, you know, take off your sponsor hat and put on your clinician hat because our clients come to us for our expertise. And we get expertise two ways, through education and then experience using that education. So Katie was really focused on education and experience, whereas KDAC initially, they were really focused on experience. So with Katie, if you completed a Katie school and you registered with Katie and uh, you became certified, you could do that within um, basically one year of full-time work. So in other words, 2,040 hours was required because you had the more education. With CCAP, you didn't necessarily need the education in the beginning, you needed hours. So in order to meet the minimum requirement for CCAP, you needed 4,000 hours, twice as many as Katie, um, because they based everything on experiential um, uh, design, right? So they, they were like really focused on that. Now the way it is, is CCAP is really kind of like, they're, they're there with the education as well. Um, uh, and, and I think they're trying to match. And really, I'll be honest, there's a competition here in, in, in California. There are three certifying bodies. They're all vying to be the top certifying body. Um, and so, uh, so there's, <laughs> there's been, well, I don't wanna say anything, get me in trouble. I'm not saying anything bad. I'm just trying to say this in a way that makes sense. They're just trying to vie to be the top person, right? Um, and I don't know what's gonna happen in the end. And the other thing is, is licensure hasn't happened here yet. CCAP has really been pushing licensure. Katie's been pushing licensure. Um, I hope it happens because I think that's important for our field. Um, and then yes, the third certifying body is CADTP. Um, and uh, yep, that's the other certifying body. So cadet. So those are the three. Um, but you only need to be, you only need to register with one. But keep an eye on things, right? And see where things are going because you may want to join a different certifying body. Yeah, I'm probably gonna try to meet with you in office hours to discuss this because it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and I'm more than happy to do that. Um, oh. And I won't, yeah, the customer service is also another big difference with between the certifying bodies. I am definitely happier with one over the other. Um, and so I, I agree with them. So, uh, but yeah, I'm happy to meet with anybody in office hours. Just realize that I can share my experience, um, but I'd be, I, I don't want to advise anyone to go into a particular direction. I just, yeah, we course. can talk about it. Yeah. So, all right, let me let's see what's the next slide. And, and again, um, this is just, this is also from the book. You can look at it. We've already been kind of like talking about some of this, but this is a comparison of what um, SAMHSA and CATC or KD is. So that SUD technician, mm -hmm. And this is where I have to adjust. Earlier I said uh, uh, peer advocate. No, it would be the same as a CATC or a CATC1. Um, a, a peer specialist would be under, would be lower. Uh, it's not even represented on here. So uh, that's the entry, entry level. So I thought there was a difference, but I couldn't remember exactly. So you see the comparison. So category one equals uh, uh, CATC2, uh, category two, which is a BA is equal to a CATC3, and then categories three and four both match up with CATC4, which is a master's degree.
All right, so let's talk about the standardized curriculum. Um, and that's one of the things that we have really worked on here at City College as far as the standardized curriculum. Um, <laughs> and then just make sure everyone is on mute if you're not already. All right, prevent ambient background noise. All right. Um, and okay, so I, this I kind of talked about too. So Katie, the California Association of Alcohol and Drugs, um, that's actually a, a misspelling. I mean, that's wrong. It should say educators, I'll have to correct that. So Katie stands for the California Association for Alcohol and Drug Educators. Um, and so they are, like I said, they've already been pushing the higher education for a very, very long time in California. Um, and then there's the National Addiction Studies Accreditation Commission, which uh, we are accredited through. And then these are the internet sources. So your first assignment was looking up some of these uh, or will be. Um, this is where you'll get some of the information. Uh, and it's I just want people to get an idea of all the different um, organizations that are out there. And so that is the purpose of the internet resources here. And I'm not gonna show this. We're gonna take a, a break after this, but are there any questions? Yes. And so Jewel says the peer specialist certificate is 76 hours of education. Um, yes, so that would be half of the 150 for the, the technician, yeah. So you can see that the education requirements increase as, uh, as the uh, ladder increases. All right, so we've covered a lot of stuff in these first two lectures. And I always say, if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed, <laughs> that is normal, um, uh, just because we've done a lot. Are there any questions? before we go on break. All right, very good. So I'll end the recording and then we will go on break.